I can still vividly recall the very first time I saw an honest-to-God computer. It was about 35 years ago. I was around seven years old, and my parents were both graduate students at the University of Oregon. My mom was studying biochemistry, my dad was studying computer science and math, and they both needed to have access to the mainframe computer. It was attached to teletypes in the computer room, and teletypes were actually like, you know, printouts. You didn't have a screen when you typed, things just kind of printed out on the page. You know, then as now, it was hard for uh, couples where both parents worked to kind of balance all the childcare. My parents did a really good job of, you know, adjusting their schedules, but sometimes you just have to both be on campus at the same time. You have to meet with your advisor, with your students. So they brought me into the computer lab and they sat me down. My father taught me a few lines of BASIC, which is a programming language you can use to, to program the computer. And they, they just let me go. And I started typing my own programs. Well, first I started playing games on the computer. And then I decided, that's fun, but I want to make my own programs. And so I started out making little trivia quizzes about the Hardy Boys. And of course, I was the only person who really took those trivia quizzes, but still, I coded them <laughs> myself. And then I made like Mad Lib style things where you could type in adjectives and nouns and verbs and adverbs, and they would get plugged into a story that would be you know, humorous depending upon what you selected. Since I was seven or eight, it was almost always like bathroom humor jokes, which I thought were really funny. But again, <laughs> I did that myself, you know, as a kid, I just sat down and I programmed this computer. But I wasn't supposed to be able to do that. You know, if you talk to people in the 60s and the 70s about computer science, about programming, they would think that programmers looked something like this, because kids weren't supposed to program computers. Programming is a serious business for men in white lab coats, for, for people like IBM, for men with slide rules. You know, uh, kids just have no business programming computers. Apparently, I didn't really get the memo. <laughs> and I wasn't really the only one. Actually, um, somebody else who didn't get the memo was this man who wrote this book, Computer Lib. His name's Ted Nelson. And my, my father had a copy of this book, and it was in our living room, and I just, you know, would, I was fascinated with it. A cool thing about this book is you can turn it over, and it's another book called Dream Machines. And the premise of this book is that you do not need to be a man in a, in a white lab coat to program a computer. Or for that matter, you know, a man in a black turtleneck to program a computer. <laughs> Ted Nelson's book, Computer Lib, starts out, it's dedicated to the proposition that every single one of us in this room can and must understand computers now. And he starts out with this sentence that says, any nitwit can understand computers, and many do. <laughs> and he points out that by some weird, ridiculous accident of history, Computers have been mystified. You know, somehow the rhetoric has developed that has convinced us that, that programming a computer is a really difficult task that's beyond the realm of mere mortals. And, and this book was dedicated to debunking that notion. And it was the first salvo in a, in a revolution and a sort of um, opposition against technocracy. He wasn't alone. There were others. Um, and this is something people don't always remember that the history of computers, the history of computing, was very much a part of the political power struggles in the 1960s and 1970s. When Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak decided to make a personal computer, they were doing that to wrestle control out of the hands of mainframe administrators, to wrestle control out of the hands of people like IBM. Another group that didn't get the memo was the group that created Community Memory in Berkeley. It looks like a newspaper stand, right? But actually, this was the first a uh, computerized bulletin board system. It was deployed in Berkeley, California in Leopold's record store. And the idea was that anybody could come in and sit down and post messages to the computer that would be stored in a, a very primitive database, and it would be used to announce events, demonstrations, you know, a band is looking for a drummer, that kind of thing, you know, very early form of Craigslist. And what happened that they didn't fully realize would happen was people started using it for other purposes. As the science fiction writer William Gibson has famously said, the street finds its uses for things. So street poets would walk in and start typing poetry and posting it in a section on community memory. You know, uh, journalists, people started reporting what they saw at the demonstrations using this system. They weren't supposed to be doing that. They weren't supposed to be programming computers in this way because computers are complicated and beyond the realm of mere mortals but they didn't really get the memo. So my parents were lured away from graduate school back down to the Silicon Valley, which is where I grew up. 
And uh, when we got down there, there was this revolution bubbling. You know, if you could spell the word computer, you could find a job in the mid-1970s in the Silicon Valley computer industry. There was a real hunger for computing uh, capabilities, for computing power. And around this time, in the late 1970s, the Homebrew Computer Club evolved into the first West Coast Computer Fair. And this is where hobbyists would show up with uh, their kits and their ideas for how computing could work, personal computing, mind you, and then they'd put them on display. And my father took me to one of these early shows in the late 1970s, and it was my first conference. You know, I was thrilled, and I just sort of wandered the floor, picking up all of the leaflets I could find, looking at the gadgets, and there was one booth in particular that I remember vividly to this day, which had just slightly better marketing, a little more branding. Their flyers were in color. There was a man in a business suit who was clearly a hippie of sorts, but dressed like a businessman. It was Apple, and their flyers were the ones, when I got home and I was sitting on the floor going through them, the ones I was just drooling over, the pictures of the Apple II computer. Now, I wanted that computer so badly. Um, I would have given my Hardy Boys books, my Judy Bloom collection, my comic books, my Mad Magazines, anything I owned to have an Apple II computer. But these machines were not cheap at that time. And they were personal computers. They were aiming after, you know, ordinary citizens. But they were about $2,000 back then for just your basic standard Apple II computer. And that was in 1970s dollars, not contemporary dollars. So, you know, my parents had just left grad school. It wasn't like they were going to run out and suddenly plop down a $2,000 Apple computer. But the cool thing was, um, just a few blocks away from where we lived in Sunnyvale, California, Steve Wozniak, he, he was one of the two people who invented the Apple II. His brother, Mark Wozniak, opened up a computer store that I think is arguably the world's first computer store. It was called Computer Plus. It was in Sunnyvale, just a few blocks from my house. So when I get out of school at the end of the day, I would run straight over to Computer Plus, which had a bunch of these Apple IIs out. And back then, they weren't selling a lot of them, and the store was usually empty. So my friends and I would hang out there, and Mark would let us play on the computers. We'd play games, but soon enough we got bored, so he gave us some books on how to program them, and we would sit there and program the computers. And the understanding was, if customers show up, then you've got to fall kind of to the back, you know, let him talk to the customers. After a while, you know, buzz started building about this new fangled personal computer, and people actually started coming to the store in droves. It even got to a part where if Mark was really busy talking to the customers, we would have to kind of fill in, you know, these kids kind of explaining what was happening to these bemused customers who had wandered in off the street. This was not supposed to be happening. Computers are serious business. You need to be in a white lab coat or a black turtleneck. You can't have kids doing this. You can't have some, someone like starting an entrepreneurial computer store in a shop the size of a dorm room. They didn't get the memo either. Now, if you had um, told me back then what would happen, how much things would change in the coming years, I don't know if I would have believed you. You know, uh, Computers got faster and faster. Our graphics got better. We went from 16 colors to 32 colors to 64 colors. It seemed there could not be any more colors. <laughs> and yet there were. And um, at around this time, we started networking our computers. You know, the technologies that fueled the growth of the internet, the ARPANET, started to leak out into the general population. And one of the, the things that was really kind of a, a moment of this movement of growth in the 80s was something called the Whole Earth Electronic Link. And uh, you might be familiar with the Whole Earth Catalog, which in many ways is sort of a spiritual uh, predecessor to the TED Talks. In fact, I think some of the same people are involved. Stuart Brand had created the Whole Earth Catalog, and then Stuart Brand in the 1980s kind of tried to take that entrepreneurial, creative social energy and put it on the internet uh, in something called The Well, which was you know, text-based virtual community. And then things kept getting faster, and our bandwidth connections got faster, and it just took off. It exploded. You know, boom or bust, whether people were making millions or, you know, just trying to get by, the computer industry kept growing steadily and globalizing. If you had told me back then, when I was playing with these Apple II computers as a kid in Mark Wozniak's shop, that someday Steve Wozniak would be on a show called Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> Steve Jobs would be like a household name as would Bill Gates. And in China, in Shanghai, people would be lining up to buy Apple II computers the size of a telephone that were, you know, magnitudes more powerful than the Apple II computers I was using. I would have laughed in your face. 
You know, I really would have. I would have said, come on, next thing you're going to tell me, the Berlin Wall is going to fall and communism is going to collapse. <laughs> but it did. It's changed and it, it's continuing to accelerate. You know, the pace of change is so intense. And that's, you know, we see this today in, in all the things people are talking about, how quickly society is changing and how quickly we're trying to change ourselves as individuals and as communities to catch up. Um, but there are some things that are still wrong. I mean, some of the things that, that Ted Nelson was talking about in this book, Computer Lib, still persist today. And that is this tendency of the people in the lab coats to, to try to tell us that we should not be programming computers, to, to, to mystify the machine. And what's happened is it's happened in a very interesting way. We actually have a rhetoric now that's super empowering about us as computer users. We put the user in the center of everything. And there are companies that have made that their, their entire proposition and done amazing things by, by talking about usability. But it's time for us to stop just thinking of ourselves as computer users and to go back to thinking of ourselves as computer programmers. And let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Um, you know, think about uh, there are shops where you go to buy your computer, and there's all the gloss and the marketing you get at home, but if something goes wrong, part of what they sell to you is this proposition that you just bring it in. We'll fix it, we'll fix it for you, and, and we'll give it back to you. And we're not really going to explain what happened. Don't worry about it. You just use it. We're the experts. We're wearing the lab coats. You, you know, you just decide. Or you, we'll decide. You just use it. Or perhaps uh, it just becomes part of the marketing campaign that you don't need to think about how it works. I love this machine. It's so user-friendly. It understands me. I don't even have to think about how it works. It just works. I mean, do you guys recognize that slogan? It just works. I don't even have to think about it. That's really scary to me when we talk about technology in that way, when we stop thinking about how it works and we let somebody else um, at a Best Buy or an Apple store kind of do all the hard part for us. And it doesn't need to be that way. There are things that people say to mystify technology, and it's really not changed that much in the last 35 years. Well, you wouldn't understand. Or it's really complicated. Or this system can't do that. Or the content management system can't do that. Or my personal favorite, well, that's just a programming issue. And in his book, Computer Lib, Nelson says there are simple things we can say when confronted with that sort of technocratic mindset. For example, we could say, why does it not work that way? You know, it's just a computer. Computers are supposed to do what we want them to do. We can say, explain to me what it is about this system that makes it not do what I want to do. And we can say, explain to me how it works, because if I don't like how this system works, I'm going to make it better myself. We can program our systems. People are programming their own computers, and they're doing it in ways that might surprise you. You might think that programming is hard. And I've talked to people about this presentation, and when I've mentioned that I'm saying we're all programmers now, even you know, with very supportive friends and loved ones, I see this kind of flicker in their eyes sometimes, like, oh, come on. But programming really is kind of hard, isn't it? And, um, I want to, I'm here to tell you that it's not. It's not nearly as hard as you think. Or, or you might think. I don't want to presume to know what you think. But it's not as hard as the men in white lab coats tell us it is. These are kids uh, at MIT, or, or they're using a technology that was created by the MIT Lifelong Kindergarten Project. And what they're doing right now is programming. They're not supposed to be doing that. And the way they program their computers is by dragging these little things around. They look like Legos or building blocks. And they're building blocks of computer code. They're just little representations you can drag around, and, and you click them together. And it's really easy to do. Within just a few minutes, somebody who has absolutely no experience programming a computer can create a, a little interactive animation that does something in response to being touched or dragged, and, and that actually moves around the screen. And it's using this kind of building block metaphor. Now, you might be thinking, and a lot of people will say, well, that's not really programming. And, and that's something that really drives me up the wall, I have to be honest. That's not real programming. It's not complicated. It's not mystifying. Who says programming has to be difficult? The whole point is for us to program our machines, to control them. It doesn't need to be hard. 
There's actually, if you Google it, a document out there called Real Programmers, and it's this kind of masculine, macho screed about how real programmers do this and real programmers do that. But what it's really about is saying that we're not supposed to be programming our own computers. And, and when it gets to be too easy to do that, you know, the real programmers and the white lab coats freak out. Google kind of agrees, though, that programming should be easy. And they've taken this MIT Scratch program, and they've folded it into a tool that allows anybody who wants to to develop applications for an Android phone. So Android's uh, a sort of open source phone operating system. I'm sure a number of people in this audience have Android phones. And a great thing is you can just sit down and put these little pieces together and create your own application that will, will do some pretty interesting things. In fact, um, a communication student at the University of San Francisco came up with this great idea to use this program to create something that would sense when you're driving your car and you receive a text message. And it kind of can tell from you know, the vibration and the speed that you're going that you're actually driving. When the text message comes in, it automatically sends a response to someone saying, I can't talk to you right now, I'm driving. And then the next version of the software would actually read their message out loud to you when it came in, so you could at least get the curiosity satisfaction of, like, what did they say? That's pretty cool. You know, it didn't take an advanced computer science degree or years and years of training to do this, and that's real programming. And every one of us in this room can do it. It doesn't need to be hard. And a lot of things we don't necessarily think of as programming are programming. For example, TEDx is a form of cultural programming. Uh, you know, the, the women who are doing this exciting stuff with seeds and hunger is a form of programming, of saying to the men in the white lab coats, no, actually, we're not going to settle with these conditions. We want things to be different. The language of usability and empowerment of users is a good thing, but it's only part of it. So I would update what Nelson says from, you know, you can and must understand computers now to we all can and must program our own computers now. We heard today about bionic legs. We heard today that IBM is mapping the human brain. We saw this amazing device that could be put on your head that's not too invasive that will allow you to control computers. I'm excited to play with those technologies, but I can tell you one thing. When I put that device on my head, I want to be the one who's doing the programming. And I hope you will too. Thanks.